reveals to us that the most striking thing about the story of Rip Van Winkle is not merely that Rip sw uh, slept 20 years, but that he slept through a revolution while he was peacefully snoring up in the mountain. A revolution was taking place that at points would change the course of history. And Rip knew nothing about it. He was asleep. Yes, he slept through a revolution. One of the great liabilities of life is that all too many people find themselves living amid a great period of social change. And yet they fail to develop the new attitude the new mental responses that the new situation demands. Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you so very much for joining us. I'm here at the Antioch Baptist Church. My name is Dr. Uzziah Anthony Harris, branch president of the Culpeper NAACP, serving not only Culpeper, but Madison and Rappahannock as well. Listen, Antioch Baptist Church has traditionally been the place where we have come to celebrate Martin Luther King Day. And we wanted to continue with that tradition even in the midst of COVID-19. The Antioch Baptist Church was the first set of free worshipers uh, here in Culpeper, Virginia in the 1850s, separating from uh, another church. And that tradition of freedom, that tradition of community activism and service still is here in the building today. So join us as we celebrate this day. Thank you so very much for coming. Come on with me. Third Monday in January uh, is the designated federal holiday honoring Martin Luther King Jr. This is the only federal holiday that focuses and has emphasis on service. It's a day where Americans are encouraged to volunteer and to do what they can to make our communities better. Martin King actually born uh, January 15th, uh, 1929, is one of the most amazing, iconic, and influential men, not just African-American men, but men uh, in American and world history. He was a civil rights leader, an African-American clergyman. He was the pastor of uh, the preeminent and historic Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Alabama. Um, and at the time when he was 35 years old, he was the youngest and just the third African-American man to win the Nobel Peace Prize. In addition to that, he founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, or the SCLC. He used this vehicle to expand the fight uh, against civil rights or for civil rights, not just in the South, but across the nation abroad. Uh, Martin King uh, used this vehicle for civil rights, but later uh, he would expand his fighting, not only to include civil rights, but also uh, to be critical of the Vietnam War, as well as fight against structural inequality as it related to economics, his war on poverty. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s accomplishments are many, from the bus boycott to the march on Selma. Uh, Martin Luther King, in his nonviolent strategy, was jailed many times fighting for freedom. On April 4th, unfortunately, in 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. was murdered uh, while he was standing on the balcony of the Lorraine Hotel. Just four days after that, uh, Congressman, the late Congressman John Conyers, attempted to put legislation in place to honor Martin Luther King Jr. This began a slow process of states beginning to recognize a, a day for Martin Luther King Jr. and his accomplishments. In 1973, Illinois became the first to do such. Ten years later, uh, this legislation was taken up by the late Senator Ted Kennedy as he wanted to bring this holiday into national focus. And in 1983, this legislation was signed by President Ronald Reagan. However, it would take 10 years, 10 years, for all states to unanimously uh, accept the King holiday. In 1993, all 50 states recognized the day. And so here we are. Uh, honoring the legacy, the life, the struggle of Martin Luther King Jr. Committed to equality and equity, committed to community service, committed to understanding 
that our mandate is to love our fellow man and woman. So on this day, the Culpeper Branch 7058 of the NAACP welcomes you to celebrate with us Martin Luther King Jr. Day of Service. We'll now have the invocation. We'll follow that with words from the community as it relates to the impact of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Followed then by a musical lesson. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor to be with you on this day as we are celebrating Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s life and legacy. My name is Pastor Eric Kalinga, a pastor of His Village Church here in Culpeper. I would like to remind us of one of the quotes from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that said, Out of a mountain of despair, a stone of hope. 2020 may have been a despair year for many of us, but 2021 is offering you and I a stone of hope. Let's pray. Father, we come before your throne. We submit ourselves to your lordship and your leadership. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and lead us toward this service. We ask blessing upon this service, blessing upon your speakers. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you will anoint every one of the speakers today. Let the word that will come out of their mouth, Father God, come directly from you. Let those words be inspiring, encouraging. And Father God, we say thank you for what Dr. Martin Luther King stood for. And we say thank you for how he brought all of us together on this day to say one day the dream will come through where we will all work together in love and service. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, my name is Jason Ford. I'm a recent member of Unity Baptist Church, and I'm thankful for this opportunity today to share with you my thoughts on the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in my hometown of Culpeper, Virginia. In the state of Virginia, Culpeper County holds an interesting legacy in terms of education, as it was the last county in 1968 to desegregate schools, finally giving black students an equal and opportune access to the same resources as their white counterparts. This comes as a stark contrast to Dr. King's perspective on education and his drive and sharing the importance of its pursuit. In a quote that I once read from an article, it says, education teaches one how to discern truth from lies, the real from fake, and the facts from fiction. And this was the same perspective that Dr. King put into his whole, into his whole perspective and his teachings on education. Throughout his life, he was a man who, who preached and practiced the pursuit of education and its importance in discernment and its importance in wisdom in one's life. And the legacy of these two as we join today in celebration of him, as we see the stark contrast, we understand the importance of what education is and our pursuit of it as we go throughout our lives. So however we receive it, whether formal or informal, through family members or through friends, understanding its importance and its improvement as we go through our lives is important and dire. Thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts and I wish you all a great Martin Luther King Day. In the aftermath of the horror of this past week, and we can have no doubt what we saw was the unapologetic malevolence and raw power of white supremacy. And in that recognition, we can recall the stories of the civil rights movement when that same ugly, overwhelming power was turned against black protesters. And then we can seek strength in the stories of leaders like Martin Luther King to bring us assurance that we can overcome. For me, what I take from Dr. King's legacy and how I best honor that legacy is to recognize it is not enough to comfortably sit and reflect on the heroism and sacrifice of his life, but to stand up and ask, what do I do? What do I do to accomplish his cry for racial justice and equality. Dr. King is one of both truth and understanding. Um, Dr. King recognized that as we confront and combat racism, um, and as we seek to overturn the structure that has promoted racism, that we have to be firmly rooted in the truth. Um, our feet have to be grounded in reality. Um, and when we speak, we have to have a certain conviction 
um, that highlights both our character and highlights the gravity of the situation. Um, also, Dr. King understood that whenever we communicated with other people who did not necessarily share our background, we have to be uh, understanding and collaborative. Um, and we have to be open and willing um, to work with others in order to advance society as a whole. Uh, I believe that worldview has to be maintained, especially in Culpeper, if we want to make progress as we confront uh, the metaphorical skeletons that are in our closet, as we confront um, the things that have haunted us um, from the past. We have to be level-headed, um, firmly rooted in truth, but also open and understanding. Everyone, my name is Brianna Simone Reeves. Happy MLK Day. Uh, as a young black girl growing up in Culpeper, Virginia, Martin Luther King Jr.'s life was so much more to me than a whitewashed public school curriculum that I learned in first grade and didn't learn anymore. Martin Luther King Jr. lived a life of radicalization. He was not passive despite popular belief, nor did he live a life of contentment. He consistently pushed the status quo. He consistently asked for more for black folks in America. He consistently did the work, did the reading did everything that it took to organize black folks to lead black folks and to get better for black folks in America and outside of America Martin Luther King Jr's life is truly the biggest representation I have of what it means to be committed to the work and to never be content with what America gives us um, Martin Luther King Jr teaches me simple as day really to keep pushing to consistently do the work even when you feel tired to just reorganize re-energize to continue doing the work and while we are recognizing and celebrating Martin Luther King Jr.'s life. I pray that you commit to doing the work as well, committing to anti-racist work, committing to furthering your education about MLK so that we can commit ourselves wholeheartedly to who he was, an amazing leader, an outstanding organizer, and an absolutely admirable man for his commitment to black folks and his continued perseverance for truth, justice, and peace in America. Happy MLK. Good afternoon. I'm Town of Culpeper Mayor Mike Olinger. I want to first start off by saying that I was honored when NAACP President Uzziah Harris contacted me about participating in this year's Martin Luther King Day of Service program. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is widely regarded as America's preeminent advocate of nonviolence and one of the greatest nonviolent leaders in world history. Drawing inspiration from both his Christian faith and the peaceful teachings of Mahatma Gandhi, Dr. King led a nonviolent movement in the late 1950s and 60s to achieve legal equality for African Americans in the United States. While others were advocating for freedom by any means necessary, including violence, Martin Luther King Jr. used the power of words and acts of nonviolent resistance, such as protests and grassroots organizing, to achieve seemingly impossible goals. He went on to lead similar campaigns against poverty and international conflict, always maintaining fidelity to his principles that men and women everywhere, regardless of color or creed, are equal members of the human family. In 1994, Congress initiated the King Day of Service, a nationwide effort to transform the federal holiday honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. into a community day of service, grounded in Dr. King's teachings. Since then, hundreds of thousands of volunteers across the country use Martin Luther King Jr. Day to perform community service each year to focus on the broader concerns of humanity. This service provides an excellent opportunity for Culpeper residents to give back to their community. Now more than ever, it is very important that we, as local leaders, pick up where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. left off and work to bring all members of our community together. I sincerely thank the organizers of today's service and thank you for the opportunity to speak at today's service. Martin Luther King Jr. may be gone, but his legacy will live forever. Our artistic expression today comes from a local musician. He is a man of immense talent. And so this tribute to MLK, will be from our dear brother. Please enjoy. I'm pleased and I was honored to be asked to uh, do a rendition of We Shall Overcome included with this hymn. Mind you, I have never sang this song or heard it up until now. I know. But I will do my best <laughs> and uh, be obedient to uh, the request and um, Pray it serves the purpose um, that uh, it was inspired by. The blood that Jesus. 
this shade for me way back on Calvary the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never ever lose its power for we shall overcome we shall overcome we shall overcome someday deep in my heart I do believe that we shall overcome someday. We shall all be free. We shall all be free. We shall all be free someday. Deep in my heart, I do believe that we shall all overcome. We are all influenced and impacted by the words, both the sermons, the speeches, even the written works and written words of Martin Luther King Jr. I am pleased to present to you today a young person in our community who has internalized the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Amari Jackson is a eighth grader at the Floyd T. Benz Middle School. And she has decided to present for us some words from Martin King Jr. and tell you how they have impacted her in her everyday life. I present to you, Mari Jackson, words from a king. Mari Jackson, and I will be reading part of What is Your Life's Blueprints by Martin Luther King Jr. And I say to you, my young friends, doors are opening to you, doors of opportunity that were not open to your mothers and your fathers. And the great challenge facing you is to be ready to face these doors as they open. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great essayist, said in a lecture in 1871, if a man can write a better book or preach a better sermon or make a better mousetrap than his neighbor, even if he builds his house in the woods, the world will make a beaten path to his door. This hasn't always been true, but it will become increasingly true. And so I urge you to study hard, to burn the midnight oil. I would say to you, don't drop out of school. I understand all the sociological reasons, but I urge you that in spite of your economic plight, in spite of the situation that you are forced to live in, stay in school. And when you discover what you will be in your life, set out to do it as if God Almighty called you at this particular moment in history to do it. Don't just set out to do a good job, set out to do such a good job that the living, the dead, or the unborn 
couldn't do it any better. If it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets like Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets like Leon Tyne Price sings before the Metropolitan Opera. Sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. If you can't be a pine at the top of the hill, be a shrub in the valley. Be the best little shrub on the side of the hill. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be a sun, be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or fail. Be the best of whatever you are. And today this means to me that when you strive to do something, do it to your best abilities. Do it for yourself. Do it how God would want you to. Pray about it. Seek help to get to your goals. Achieve them like no one else would. And like Martin Luther King said, if you can't be a sun, be a star. And you should be that star. You should work hard to achieve whatever you want to. You should work hard and be that star that everyone looks up to. Be you and don't give up on your dreams. Don't give up on your passion because in this time of history, be what you want to. Thank you. We are blessed and pleased to introduce to you our keynote speaker for the MLK Day of Service event. Um, this man is no, no stranger to our community, uh, a man of faith, a man of activism. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce to some and present to others the Reverend and Pastor Adrian Sledge. Adrian D. Sledge is the founder of the Got to Move Outreach Program, pastor of the Move Church here in Culpeper, Virginia. Uh, pastor Sledge is a native of San Antonio, Texas, uh, where he graduated from the St. Gerard's High School in 1992. After completing a year of college, he went into the U.S. Army, where he served as a unit supply specialist and an instructor for over 26 years. Pastor Sledge served in various capacities uh, and in numerous churches throughout his career in the United States of America, to include uh, the assistant youth pastor at the True Vision Baptist Church in San Antonio, Texas, as well as the pastoral advisor and director of children and youth training at the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in North Little Rock, Arkansas. He was also the supply pastor of the New Chestnut Baptist Church in Mechanicsville, Virginia. And he was the senior pastor of the Antioch Baptist Church uh, right here in Culpeper, Virginia. Pastor Sledge he is a certified, or is certified rather, in religious studies and pastoral care. Uh, he gathers certifications at the Evan Smith Institute at Virginia Union University in Richmond, Virginia. He holds an Associates of Science degree in military technologies uh, from the Pulaski Technical College and a Bachelor's of Arts in religion from the American Military University. He is currently pursuing a Master's of Science degree in marriage counseling and family counseling at Liberty University. Pastor Sledge is married to the former Ronica Campbell of North Little Rock, Arkansas. Pastor Sledge is a gifted mentor, a gifted teacher, a gifted preacher, and a wonderful counselor. He is committed to helping people fulfill their goals and their dreams. Pastor Sledge has been on the battlefield on multiple occasions in Culpeper, Virginia. And we are pleased, more than pleased, to have him as our speaker for today's celebrations. Pastor Adrian Sledge. Good evening. My name is Adrian Sledge, the pastor of the Move Church, founder of the Got to Move 
maximizing opportunity gaining victory through excellence outreach program. I would like to thank the NAACP Cold Pepper Chapter, your president, Dr. Josiah Harris, and Vice President Frank Lewis for the distinguished privilege and honor to be this year's Martin Luther King Celebration Speaker in 2021. I know this is a time that we usually share and come together at the Antioch Baptist Church of Cold Pepper. But now, because of our pandemic and the circumstances, these are the hands that have been dealt. But nevertheless, we're going to continue to celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King, whether you're on your couch, uh, living room, family room, uh, no matter where you may be. We're going to continue to drive home his, his preaching and teaching of freedom and peace and nonviolence even through this pandemic and perilous time. But just for a few minutes, I just want to share with you and talk to you about the enemy within. The enemy within. There is a biblical and historic record in Joshua chapter 7 where the children of Israel took a great defeat. At this time, the children of Israel had been delivered from Egypt and had been promised a land of milk and honey from God. But in order to get that, they had to fight battle after battle, win war after war. And by this time in Joshua chapter 7, the children of Israel, the nation of Israel, have formed into what we call a superpower. They were financially prosperous. They had the best army at this time in the world. But they found themselves in a situation where they couldn't win. The record tells us in Joshua chapter 7, as they got ready to prepare a battle in a town or a city called Ai. And Joshua, as he prepared his troops, he, he, he thought that maybe I don't need so many because this country or this piece of land had so many little resources and soldiers to fight. Unfortunately, when they got to battle, Israel was defeated handily. They were defeated. It was a humiliating defeat. It broke the spirit and the will. And Joshua went into a depression. Because Joshua was confused. How can we be this superpower house? This country that has not lost a battle. We've come so far for so long. How is it that God promised us prosperity and land and we lost this battle? Joshua would think that maybe because of this loss, other countries, other nations will laugh at us and think that we are a mockery. Maybe they'll decide to take up arms. May it come after us in the midst of our weakness. And as he was praying, as he was thinking these things, God showed up. And what God explained to him, the reason you lost this battle, the reason you was not victorious in what you were trying to do is because you have someone or something that is hindering the camp. You have some individuals in your camp that are not operating according to my will and to the rules and regulations of my commandments. The issue is 
that, that nation, that small country did not defeat you. They weren't the reason why you lost. But the reason they lost, because you thought you had some allies and some partners fighting alongside of you, but now you must realize the reality there are some enemies in your camp. There are some individuals that look like you. There are some individuals that walk like you. There are some individuals that fought wars and battles with you. But because of their integrity and the lack of moral character, it is you cannot be successful or win a battle because until you deal with the issues within your own camp. See, what Joshua failed to realize, that everyone that fights with you, everyone that you consider an ally, will sometimes, turn against you. The same allies that Joshua depended on, the same ally that the children of Israel trusted to build their nation, to build their civilization was the same ally that turned into an enemy. And when I look at what's going on in America today, America, the superpower, the country with so much wealth, the country with so much dominant military force that no country in the world could be able to face and compete with our military. But our country is in shambles from an economic standpoint. We're in shambles from a pandemic standpoint. And we are terrible and in a bad situation when it comes to our social system. Because what has happened, our country has choose and chosen to align with the ally. And now this ally has become the enemy. Let me take my time. What is this ally? When this country was formed by immigrants who came from Europe, who wanted to escape oppression and the restrictions of their religious belief. But what happened somewhere in the midst of leaving Europe and coming to the colonies and colonization, they aligned themselves with an ally that eventually would turn on him. And the ally I'm talking about, the ally I'm talking about that this country has partnered with, the ally of the country I'm talking about that, that, that was built on, our democracy was built on, constitutions were written, and that ally was called racism. This country has used racism as an ally for far too long. Racism was an ally when this country moved and pushed out Native Americans from their native lands, from their homes, from all the places that they know. This same country aligned itself with the ally called racism to enslave millions of Africans, separating them from their homes, treating them less than animals, creating a system that even if they escape to freedom, that they can be considered fugitives and can be grabbed and sent right back. This country has aligned itself as an ally with racism that even after the Civil War and during Reconstruction, it was the alliance with racism that created Jim Crow all over the South, segregated our schools. We had to fight 
and for our rights to vote, all because the alliance of racism. Racism has become a friend to this country. Racism has become the best friend to this country. And I know many of us don't want to hear this. I know many of us don't want to talk about it. But the reality is racism has been around not because it, it had to be, but because we wanted it to be. And even in the midst after the civil rights movement, we decided to repackage racism. We repackage it by, by putting it in our school systems, our government, in our White Houses, in our capitals. Racism has been the driving force of how we created laws in this country. And even to the point, it's just like that best friend you don't want everybody to meet. We have covered it up in ways. Now it's called systematic racism and we don't want to talk about it. But what has happened, this ally that we call racism, this ally that this country has depended on to build this so-called democracy has now shown itself in the midst of the capital that happened last week. This ally has shown itself that it literally I'm going to destroy this country. It's the same democracy that was built right beside the ally of racism is now the same ally that has become the enemy and going to destroy the same democracy that it created. Because one thing about this ally, this ally that you think is the reality has become an enemy within our camp. This country is great. This country has been prosperous. This country has won wars after war. This country has done some great things. But the one stain, the one problem that we can never seem to get out of the hump is the ally that we call racism. And the reason we cannot get rid of racism and because it's easier to identify the enemy than it is an ally. And racism has been hiding in the midst of our country for so long. But now, when we try to hide it, we try to get some things together. We put in a black president. We try to move forward in our country. But just like a jealous friend, just like a jealous lover, racism said, no, I won't be stopped. Because if I can't control the narrative, if I can't control the problem, I will get people who are on my side. And if the country will not be an ally with me, I will be an enemy within. And what happened is we, we ignored it. We thought everything was good. We thought racism was no longer a part of this country. We, we decided to face the facts that, hey, maybe now that we got a black president, maybe uh, we're, we're doing good now. But four years ago, racism showed back up. Racism showed up in the form of an individual that was conniving, lack of character and integrity. And this it showed its face. The ally showed his face and became the enemy. It started destroying this country from within. And we're wondering what's going on. Why are we seeing this? Why are we having these problems? And I must tell you, we can blame the media. We can blame the right or the left. But the reality before the media existed, before there were Republicans and Democrats or independents, Racism has always been here. 
Fortunately, what I understand about the media, media is not for just black people. Because as black people, we don't need the media to create an image and tell us that racism is existing. We don't need the left or the right to tell us that racism exists. We don't need the media to tell us that it exists because we're living it. And while many of you are making this about right or left, for us as African Americans, us as immigrants as coming to this country, we're making this about life or death. And while you're struggling and saying that racism don't exist, you have convinced yourself that the left and the media is lying and about fake news. Everything is all good because now there's an enemy in the camp and you cannot recognize it because it's been fighting with you. It's been walking with you. It's been an ally with you in the creation of this country that we have been fighting as black people just trying to get some fairness. And now it's become your enemy. At the Capitol, racism showed its ugly head. The same racism that you had aligned yourself with has now become your enemy. That same racism where that whipped and beaten our black slave day after day had a working from sun up to sun down, stripping families apart. That same racist friend that in the midst of the Civil War fought and succeed, succeeded from this union in order to preserve the enslavement of black people. This same racism that lynched people left and right who were just trying to vote. This same racism that segregated our army, segregated our schools, the same racism that we see where we see officers and law enforcement gunning down black men, unarmed black men and black women. But now, the same racism that we've experienced every day, the same racism that we got to have a conversation with our children every time they walk out the door, that same racism that we got to tell our daughters to be careful and come straight home, that same racism where I got to have more degrees than the next man just to get a job making minimum wage, that same racism that you aligned yourself with is the same racism that had you hiding in a basement. The enemy within. It acts like Obadiah 1 and 7 says that there are going to be people that are going to act peaceful. They're going to act like they're friends and then they're going to turn on you. The same thing that created that this democracy in this country was built on the fabric of racism. It's the same fabric and the same racism that is trying to destroy the democracy. If you don't believe me, right, it was racism. We have tried to preserve racist symbols. We have tried to preserve racist statues that, that present and motivate hate. If you don't believe me, watch the news. Watch your media that you so love. Watch the right. Talk to your left. Talk to your right. Talk to me that I saw with my own eyes how they lowered the American flag and took Confederate flags and walked up and out of the Confederate cap of the Capitol walking around with Nazi signs. If that's not a form of racism, but unfortunately this time, the racism did not affect black people. The racism did not attack black people. The racism, the ally already attacked their own. And racism should not be a problem. Hate should not be a problem only when it affects you. But understand that we are all connected in this country because eventually what affects us will affect you. And what affects you will affect us. Racism is the enemy that destroying this country. Racism is the enemy that was an ally for so many years. But now God is saying he's not pleased. God said we're not being successful the entire, just like in Joshua. Joshua was thinking these countries are laughing at us. We have become a laughing stock of the world. We are being laughed at. We are being, now countries are setting up their arms because they think we're vulnerable and they think we're weak. 
We have sent almost 20,000 soldiers to have to defend our nation's capital. And these terrorists, these racists, these, 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 these people, they're not from China. They're not from Russia. They're not from Iran or Iraq. They're not Al Qaeda. These are people from Texas, Arkansas, Tennessee, Louisiana, Maryland, Virginia, and even Culpeper. How have we gotten here? How did we get here? We got here because we had, we had aligned ourselves for so many years with racism. Use racism as a tool. Use racism to defend. And now it has turned on us. It is here to destroy us. Because racism is greedy. Just like this man, he saw, the reason they lost, he saw some stuff and he couldn't keep his eyes off and he had to have it. Racism is greedy. Racism is destructive. Racism is selfish. And it's the very thing within our country. If we do not handle, it will destroy us. It will destroy our democracy. It will destroy everything we worked hard for. The enemy in our camp is racism. When do we decide to move on from that? When do we decide to destroy? God wants better from us. He said, my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways. Pray for me, seek me. Then I will heal their land. There cannot be no healing until we humble ourselves. There cannot be no healing until we repent. There cannot be. As long as this country continue to make racism their ally, we're going to continue to be the laughing stock of the world. We're going to continue to destroy the economic movement of what we're trying to do. This pandemic would never get better. These are signs. Listen, I'm done. I just want to thank the NAACP for this opportunity to share with you. This opportunity for us to grow together. Here in Culpeper, I pray that I, we continue to try to strive for unity. Continue to divorce ourselves from racism because that's the, the enemy that's in our camp that's destroying us. That's the enemy that we decided to align ourselves with. Now it's time to get rid of it. Thank you. God bless you and may God keep you. I take the time to recognize our very own our community captains, if you will, those who have embraced the model of community service and embodied it to such a degree that all of us must take notice. Again, on this day, Martin Luther King Jr. federal holiday, we want to take notice of those persons who serve their communities well. Our first award recipient is a woman by the name of Brianna Simone Rees. She is in fact a Culpeper native and graduate of Eastern View High School. She is currently a student at the University of Mary Washington. She is a leader, an activist, a believer, uh, one to be reckoned with in our current society. She is uh, a member of the Virginia State Conference NAACP, where she serves in the Youth and College Division as Vice President. She is also the President uh, of the chapter at the University of Mary Washington. She continues uh, on a number of uh, fronts to be a voice uh, 
that cannot be quieted. She was in part one of the organizers of this summer's uh, march that had over 800 persons. This particular march uh, garnered attention from all over the state as it highlighted the injustices as it related to police brutality. In addition to all these things, uh, Brianna Reeves continues uh, to be on the Dean's List at her school and continues to strive on all fronts uh, to say and do whatever is necessary to highlight injustice and to bring justice where it is needed. Our first recipient of this year's Community Captain Award, those who serve with distinction in the area of community service is Brianna Simone. Our next recipient of the Community Captain Award, uh, an award aimed at highlighting uh, distinction as it relates to the area of community service is Pastor Adrian Sledge, pastor of the Move Church. Uh, he has been involved in a number of activities, not just this summer, last year, uh, but throughout his time here in Culpeper, Virginia. Uh, again, a proponent for justice, a proponent for change. We thank Reverend Sledge for his continued pursuit of justice in Culpeper County. Our final recipient of our Community Captain Award highlighting uh, distinctions in community service here in Culpeper, Virginia, is a woman who needs no introduction whatsoever. Amy Hunter is our third recipient. Uh, she is the mother of three young boys and one wonderful husband, Dana Hunter, DeMayo, Diego, Diaz. Uh, she continues to serve not only her family, but her community with distinction. Spearheading an effort this summer to petition for the removal of the flag at Lynn Park. Amy was fierce in standing up the Board of Supervisors, meeting and speaking out for what she believed was, was right. Even in the midst of criticism, in the midst of naysayers who would question whether or not she even had a reason to stand up and speak, Amy was forthright and she was a leader and continues to lead in our community. We thank you for what she continues to do and look forward to the many things that she will do. Our third and final recipient of this Community Service Award is Amy Hunter. We will conclude our program with the benediction. Uh, after you hear his voice, hear his prayer, we will end our program with the famed song, Lift Every Voice. Ladies and gentlemen, it was a great honor to be with you on this day. I would like to say thank you to Dr. Harris for organizing this amazing event and for inviting us to be a part of it. But before I offer the benediction, I would like to read a couple of scriptures for us. The first one is Romans 12, 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. I would like 2021 to be a year where we are all gonna make this commitment to say, we will love each other with brotherly love. We will offer honor to one another in service as well. But the second passage I want to read is found in Numbers 6, 24 to 26. But I am going to read this as a prayer for you and I. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. May the Lord give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys, and have a fantastic day.
Listen, we want to thank everybody who took the time to join us for today's MLK celebration, day of service, uh, day of freedom, day of equality. We want to thank all the sponsors who took the time uh, to donate to the efforts and the cause of the NAACP. Uh, we want to thank those who uh, continue to fight with us and believe in the cause uh, that injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. We urge every single person to join with us. Uh, the NAACP meets on the third Thursdays of every month here in Culpeper, Virginia. We meet via Zoom uh, due to COVID-19 concerns, but hey, we are still accessible. Uh, we have a Facebook page, Culpeper NAACP, as well as a web page, Culpeper NAACP.org. We have a Twitter page, Culpeper NAACP. And we're just looking for you to get plugged in in whatever way possible. We are in the midst of volatile times in our country. But one thing is for sure, those who are positive, those who fight for the ideals of justice, love, and truth, they will in fact overcome. And so here we are once again saying goodbye, the oldest, the boldest, the baddest, the largest civil rights organization signing off, saying happy Martin Luther King Day to you and continue in your service to make your community the greatest it can be.